We are so thrilled to be able to create this space to bring all of these incredible Black scientists together. Before we start, I want to thank our generous conference sponsors without which these events would not be possible. I also want to give people a heads up that if you look in the bottom right corner of the screen, there should be an option to access the live transcript. Additionally, if you wanna share any conference highlights, if you really enjoy a talk or wanna share anything that you learned today, please do so using the hashtag BINConference2020. Today for our first session, we'll hear from seven amazing speakers on addiction, motivation, neurological, neuropsychiatric, and neurodegenerative disorders. Just so you know what to expect, we'll have two sessions of three to four presentations uninterrupted, during which you can drop questions into the chat. Um, if you do so, please indicate the person for which you're asking this question, to which you're asking this question. Then we'll break for a 10 minute Q&A and I'll take questions from the chat to ask the speakers. Before we get to the talks, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our judges. We have Dr. Matt Wimmer, an assistant professor of neuroscience and psychology at Temple University, where he studies the influence of drug abuse in fathers on future generations using rodent models. Next up, we have Dr. Lisa Briand, an assistant professor of neuroscience and psychology at Temple University, where she studies electrophysiological mechanisms underly underlying drug relapse. We also have Dr. Sandro Damasquita, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, where he explores the role of the meningeal lymphatic vasculature in brain health and disease. Finally, we have Dr. Yolan Smith, the, the Division Chief of Neuropharmacology and Neurological Diseases at Yerkes National Primate Research Center. All right, thank you so much to our judges for being here today. So with that, and without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to our first speaker, Alexander W. Lair. All right. Uh, hello, my name is Alexander Wubachet Lair, uh, and today I'll be talking about uh, Neuroligand 4X and 4Y's uh, divergent translational uh, modifications. Um, I currently am a postback at NINDS in, in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, and then, So uh, neural ligands are synaptic adhesion molecules uh, found at the postsynaptic density uh, where they bind to norexin, which allows for the formation um, and maintenance of a lot of synaptic function. And uh, so thus in that vein, mutations in neural ligands have been implicated in um, many uh, aut uh, in autism spectrum disorders, as well as Tourette's and schizophrenia, and even in some cases, epilepsy. Um, and so interestingly, the lab uh, studies a lot of the isoforms of neuroligin. So neuroligin one uh, is excitatory and neuroligin two is found in inhibitory synapses. Um, and today I'm gonna be specifically talking about neuroligin 4X and 4Y, which are more recent uh, evolutionary developments uh, and in that they're primate specific. Um, so neuroligin 4X and 4Y share 97% sequence identity uh, and thus were presumed to be the same uh, protein and in papers up to this point, we're broadly referred to as neuroligand four. Um, so with only 17 amino acid differences, we then uh, looked at if there was a difference and we found that the trafficking is different. So neuroligand four Y uh, using uh, biotinylation assay, we see that four Y doesn't uh, traffic to the surface. Whereas if we just swap one of the 17 uh, amino acid differences between four X and four Y, we see a rescue in that uh, forward trafficking. So that S93P um, amino acid swap has uh, a, a large robust effect on the forward trafficking. And then, uh, sorry, next. So uh, next we wanted to look at the phosphorylation of um, neuroligand 4X and 4Y. So interestingly, PKC we saw does not uh, phosphorylate 4Y whereas it robustly phosphorylates 4X at the 30707 site. And um, functionally what this does is it increases spine number and, enhan and enhances uh, excitatory AMPA and NMDA currents. And then, um, so uh, uh, more recently the lab discovered that uh, serine 712 is phosphorylated by PKA in 4X and again, not 4Y. Uh, and I wanted to look at if this was affecting the surface trafficking again. Uh, so I ran a biotinylation assay and 
we see that statistically there was uh, no change in neuroligand 4X's uh, trafficking in a phosphomimetic and a phosphodead mutant. Um, but uh, what we did discover is that there is one uh, amino acid difference between 4X and 4Y uh, within this, uh, near these phosphorylation sites. So upon swapping uh, 4X's uh, 710 amino acid to the uh, analogous amino acid found in 4Y, we see that uh, PKC cannot phosphorylate uh, neuroligand 4X. And again, PKC does not phosphorylate 4Y, but uh, upon that doing that amino acid swap, we see a robust rescue of that, um, of that uh, phosphorylation phenotype. And again, we see the same thing with PKA where it's phosphorylating 4X and not, uh, not phosphorylating 4Y, but upon this uh, single amino acid swap, we're able to rescue the phosphorylation in 4Y. Um, so, um, sorry, and then next slide. Um, so, uh, in essence, we see that despite neuroligand 4X and 4Y only having 17 amino acid differences, um, they differ dramatically in the way they're trafficked and phosphorylated. So we've already found, excuse me, two kinases that uh, robustly phosphorylate 4X and not 4Y, and that by just swapping one of those amino acid differences, we're able to uh, swap the phenotype as well. Um, and so, uh, I guess the next questions we have to look at is we know what the PKC uh, kinase is doing to our 4X protein, but uh, what is the PKA kinase doing? Um, so uh, currently we're doing uh, surface versus intracellular immunofluorescence um, on a phosphomimetic and phosphodead, as well as doing spine count and, uh, and, and comparing morphology between the wild type and phosphomutants. Um, and I would also like to be able to do some electrophysiology experiments. Um, and lastly, the a larger question is what is neuroligand 4Y's function if it's not being uh, recruited to the surface? Um, and so uh, on that note, I would like to thank the uh, Black and Neuro Conference organizers for hosting this event. And I would like to thank my mentors and lab members. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexander. Next up, we have Temi Toba Oluboka. Hi, uh, my name is Temi Toba Oluboka, and I will, I will be presenting my summer systematic review project on the antidepressant efficacy of PPAR gamma agonist medications in bipolar depression and major depression. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background, both insulin resistance and neuroinflammation have been linked to major depression and bipolar depression, creating a poor course of outcome for patients. To mitigate this, diabetic medications such as metformin or semeglutide have been prescribed to treat both insulin resistance and inflammation. PPAR gamma agonists are a specific class of diabetic medications and have been used in treatment. However, people are finding that patients are actually improving their depression symptoms while they're on this medication. So the goal of my study was to understand the antidepressant efficacy of PPAR gamma medication and how this affects and how this effect relates to biomarkers of glucose metabolism and inflammation. Next slide, please. So for my methods, I conducted a literature review on PubMed, and I had three rules to establish inclusion. So the first rule was that participants in these studies must have a clinical diagnosis for a major depressive episode, either major depression or bipolar depression. My second rule was that prospective treatment with PPAR gamma agonist or metformin must have been administered. And the third rule was that assessment of depression symptoms and biomarkers of glucose metabolism or inflammation had to have been measured at baseline and there must have been evidence of follow-up. So in total, I included 10 studies, six of which were randomized control trials and four were open label studies. Next slide, please. So in my randomized control trials, pioglitazone, which is a PPAR gamma agonist, was widely used and it was compared to placebo and in two studies compared to metformin, which acted as a control. Metformin is not a uh, PPAR gamma agonist. However, it is a diabetic medication, so it acted as a control. And rosiglitazone was used, which is a PPAR gamma agonist in an open label study. 
And the outcome measures that were used in these studies to measure patients' depression scores were the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale, and the Inventory of Depression Symptomatology. And this table includes all the 10 studies that I reviewed, and it has all the descriptors and information on those studies. Next slide, please. So for my results in the double blinded randomized control trials, pioglitazone had a larger significant change in depression scores for all patients in five of the studies. However, one study, which was called the AFTAB et al study, um, found a negative result where the placebo group actually had a more significant decrease in depression scores than the pioglitazone group. In all, in all of the open label studies that I reviewed, all four of the studies showed that treatment with pioglitazone or rosiglitazone could induce a significant antidepressant effect in patients. Next slide, please. So when it came to looking at the association between improved symptoms and biomarkers for glucose metabolism, HOMA-IR, which is an assessment and measurement of insulin resistance, was found to have a significant association with the improvement in depression scores in three of these studies. In two studies that also assessed for HOMA-IR, however, they did not find this significant association. And in one paper, the Lynn et al. study, um, decreased um, depression scores were associated with um, OGTT and FPG, which are both biomarkers of glucose metabolism. For inflammation, only two um, biomarkers were found to be significant. In the Kemp et al. study, um, this was the interleukin-6, also known as the IL-6, um, was found to have an association, a significant association with the improvement of depression symptoms in patients. And in the AFTAB et al. study, leptin was found to have a significant association with the decrease in depression scores. Next slide, please. So with the improvement of these biomarkers, it could suggest that insulin resistance and inflammation also improve in conjunction with depression symptoms when patients are using P per gamma agonist. However, it is still unclear as to what is responsible for this antidepressant effect that is being seen in these patients. So whether or not it is biomarkers of glucose metabolism or inflammation that play a larger role in this. Metformin should also be um, noted because although it is not a PPAR gamma agonist, it still could possibly have a, it could be a potential alternative for patients if they're not responding to traditional mood stabilizers or PPAR gamma agonists. So future studies should be conducted in order to create a clear connection between patient symptoms and the biological markers affecting symptom severity. Thank you so much. Uh, next slide. These are just my references. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Temi. Next, we have Alexis Cooper. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexis Cooper, and I'm a research technician in the Costa Lab in the Department of Behavioral Neuroscience at Oregon Health and Science University. Next slide, please. I'm excited to tell you about our recent experiments demonstrating the feasibility of using dreads in non-human primates to manipulate neural activity in amygdala projections to the nucleus accumbens. Now, we're investigating this pathway because it's been shown to contribute substantially to the way that we learn from good and bad choices. And we hope to understand how its dysfunction contributes to addiction and mental health disorders. So to start, dreads are designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. They are genetically engineered G-couple G couple or G-protein coupled receptors that can only be activated by a ligand that's not naturally found in the body. And with the injection of our ligand or designer drug, we are able to activate or inhibit those receptors. Next slide. Now, dreads have not been widely used to study the primate brain for a variety of reasons, but in part because we lack cell-specific Cree lines that allow us to control where dreads are being expressed. And in this study, we are exploring the approach to transduce basolateral amygdala neurons projecting to the nucleus accumbens with inhibitory dreads. We used two adult rhesus macaques in these experiments. Each monkey received injections of two viral vectors in the same surgery. And we used the AAV2 retroviral vector to retrogradely transfect amygdala neurons that projected to the nucleus accumbens with Cree recombinase. This AAV2 
retrovector was injected bilaterally into the nucleus accumbens core in each monkey. And we use the second viral vector to conditionally express the inhibitory dread receptors in the amygdala neurons that would express CRE. And one monkey received a unilateral basal nucleus amygdala injection of our dread vector. Next slide. Now, one of the difficulties with using dreads in non-human human primate models is the uncertainty surrounding whether or not the viral vectors injecting are injected are working as intended. So what we did next was test the functionality of the dreads in vivo using a non-invasive neuroimaging of resting state fMRI connectivity. Now I'm not a neuroimager and the analysis of this data is ongoing, but I wanted to briefly show you that this is an effective way of demonstrating where dreads are being expressed and whether or not they're working. We collected scans before and after we administered our designer drug, desclorclozapine. And for this one pair of voxels as shown, one in the amygdala and one in the nucleus accumbens, there is a decrease in the correlation of their time series after our designer drug is injected. And if we quantify how often we see this same reduction in functional connectivity throughout the entire amygdala, we can construct a course map that allows us to infer where the dreads are being expressed. Next slide, please. Now, to validate the dread expression, I completed a double labeled immunofluorescent staining procedure to characterize the Cree dependent expression of inhibitory dreads. And we expected to see the neurons expressing the Cree EGFP to fluoresce green in the amygdala and in other areas of the brain that project to the nucleus accumbens and neurons that express the m cherry tagged cre dependent inhibitory dread receptors to fluoresce red, but only in the amygdala. We found substantial double labeling throughout the amygdala in both animals, which means that a number of cells express both CRE and inhibitory dreads. And when quantified, the yellow double labeled neurons in the amygdala were between 18 and 40 3% in one monkey and 4 and 19% in the other. And we believe that the different levels of this expression seen in each animal are related to using a single large injection versus two smaller injections to give the same amount of virus. Next slide, please. And overall, these results in combination with our preliminary fMRI results indicate that we can successfully use intersectional chemogenetic approach to inhibit the neural activity in amygdala neurons projecting to the nucleus accumbens. So an immediate next step is to use the histological data to inform a more targeted interrogation of resting state fMRI data and to begin using this approach to modulate behavior in learning and decision-making tasks. Now, I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to participate in this conference. Thank you to the members of the McBride Lab that supported us through this project, Black People in STEM Matter, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Alexis. All right, now we have about 10 minutes for Q&A from the audience. If you haven't yet and you had a question, if you wanna go ahead and drop it into the Q&A and just indicate who it's for and then I'll be able to ask that live. Our first question is for Matika. Matika, do you predict that mice trained on natural rewards like sucrose would also show the faster love of pressing phenotype or do you think it's specific to cocaine slash drug or abuse exposure? Um, I don't think that it would be specific to cocaine because there is evidence that shows that there's a lot of overlap between brain regions that process natural rewards and rewards for uh, and um, rewards for drugs and abuse per se. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case where they did show that faster pressing phenotype. Thank you. Next up, I have a question for Alexis. Given that the amygdala is also involved in regulating mood, do you plan on examining this as well? Hi, thank you for your question. Um, not necessarily in our immediate next steps, but it's definitely something that we can, you know, carve into a new experiment. Great, thank you. I have another question for Matika. How do you think the results that you found relate to relapse in human populations? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think 
really it's the point of the cue. I think really the cue has like a huge impact on what um, the effect on what we think these drugs are going to do, interestingly enough. And so I actually, um, I briefly mentioned it, but I didn't get to go deeply into it, but um, I had a subset of animals with ethers arrays in the prelimbic cortex and the accumbens core. Um, so I really wanted to see what that um, interaction would be. So it would be interesting to see if I would see that same deficit. Um, it, I would see kind of like similar changes as to those people who didn't use the electrophysiology work in relapse work as well. Great, thank you, Matika. Uh, we have a question from Honoré, if you wanted to go ahead and ask it. Hey, so I had a question for Alexis about, um, I was wondering if you guys, if your lab has done any work with excitatory dreads, or if you've just looked at inhibitory so far. Hi, thank you for your question. So far, we've only in our lab here at the Oregon Health and Science University, we've only really looked at inhibitory drugs, but again, in the future, we're kind of a newer lab, and in the future, we'd love to experiment with excitatory and inhibitory. We plan on doing so in future experiments. Thank you, Alexis. Next up, I have a question for Temi. Do you think that PPAR gamma agonists would only work for subtypes of mood disorders or would they work more broadly? Um, thank you for your question. I think that it would work more closely for mood disorders, specifically depression, just because the PPAR gamma receptor modulates glucose metabolism. So with that connection, I think that for at least what the research has shown, that is most impactful for bipolar depression and major depression. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question. Um, I'm not sure who, okay, we have a question for Temi. Um, do you notice sex differences in PPAR gamma efficacy? Okay, thank you for your question. Um, there actually is not a lot on this topic and sex differences is something that I have not yet seen. There's so far when I was doing my review, there was only a total of 12 papers published on this topic. So 10 of which were included in, in my presentation and two were systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So I do not have an answer for that question, but I imagine that that would be a very interesting topic to look into. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question for Alexander. Are there any known disease models or functional changes as a result of expressing NLGN4X versus 4Y? And what are the effects of having one versus the other? Um, well, that is something that has been uh, difficult to study uh, because there is no good model for uh, studying neuroligand 4X and 4Y in animals. Um, that's because uh, rat, rat, rats and mice um, don't express uh, neuroligand 4X and 4Y. Uh, mice do have a neuroligand 4 that uh, only shares a 60% uh, sequence identity and has been shown to be found at uh, a different type of synapse. So um, Largely, we haven't been able to look at animal models, um, but to address the second part of that question is um, uh, in terms of uh, understanding, uh, I guess, a almost behavioral phenotype of the uh, of neuroligand 4X versus 4Y uh, expression. Um, we have, there is a paper from 2004 that uh, sequenced a family and found that there is a mutation in um, neuroligand 4X uh, and that males in the family um, were the only ones that presented autism um, spectrum symptoms and that the females were uh, carriers for that. So it would skip generations. Um, and yeah, so for identifying uh, a, a behavioral phenotype uh, within, um, uh, uh, I guess, a, a mutation within that, um, we, it is largely uh, elusive just because there is no good animal model for that. Um, that's a good question and that's something we, we've struggled with. Thank you. Okay, we'll take these last two questions in the chat and then we'll have to move on. Um, for Alexis, did you do any segmentation of the white matter? If so, how did you go about it? What software did you use, et cetera? Hi, thank you for your question. No, to my knowledge, we did not do any white matter segmentation. 
Okay, thank you. And then lastly, for Matika, have you investigated the impact of changing the order in which the delays are presented, i.e. decreasing over the session versus increasing? Additionally, did you find any sex differences? So with this specific um, task that I'm doing here, I was just looking at delay. I um, mean, I was just looking at one specific delay, four seconds. Um, and that was really, I focused on that four second delay because that's kind of in previous literature where I was looking at, that's kind of where I saw the largest differences between um, animals with a history of cocaine self-administration and those that didn't. Um, and so I didn't see any differences when I increased the, when I increased the delay to six seconds or eight seconds, um, unfortunately. And so also with this, I was only using male sprig dolly rats. So additionally, I would want to look at females to see if there would be any sex differences as well. Great, thank you so much. All right, that concludes our Q&A for, for, for this first session. If you could bear with me for one second, I need to reshare my screen because our next presentation has audio. Okay. All right, next up we have Naisha Savory. One second. Naisha. Okay, Naisha was not able to make it. Um, let's see. Hello, I'm Naisha Savory, and I will be discussing mitochondrial quantity differences across hippocampal subregions. Our lab focuses on the hippocampus. It is the brain region necessary for creating long term memories and has four subregions, which you can see in the image to the right. This image is of a mouse hippocampus and shows CA1, CA2, CA3 and the dentate gyrus, or DG. Each subregion has a specific specialization needed to create spatial, contextual, temporal, and in our lab's interest, social memory. Because CA2 has been shown to be essential for social memory in mice, understanding more about how CA2 functions may provide insights into disorders that have deficits in social behaviors, like autism. You can see the difference in CA2 and the other subregions in the image, as CA2 neurons are illuminated in yellow, by the fluorescent protein TD tomato. To learn more about the genes regulating CA2 function in social memory, we compare the transcriptomes, which is a set of mRNAs expressed by a cell, of CA2 cell bodies and dendrites to neighboring CA1, CA3, and DG cell bodies and dendrites using RNA-seq. As shown by the heat map of gene ontologies at the top right, our lab found that mitochondria gene expression was enriched in CA2 cell bodies and dendrites compared to the neighboring subregions cell body and dendrites, as indicated by significant p-value shaded in red in, on the heat map. Mitochondria are organelles that supply energy to cells, and cells that have high energy demands usually have more of them. Thus, we wanted to test whether CA2 neurons have differences in the number or size of mitochondria compared to neighboring regions. The image at the bottom right is representative of confocal images of mitochondria stained with COX-4 in CA2 cell bodies and dendrites. I analyzed the size and number of mitochondria per cell in each subregion across three mice using these very images. Based on our RNA-seq data, we hypothesized that CA2 would have more and larger mitochondria in the cell bodies and dendrites than areas CA1 and CA3. Our results showed that for cell bodies, CA2 had more and larger mitochondria than CA1, but fewer mitochondria with no side differences compared to CA3. In contrast, in dendrites, CA2 had more and larger mitochondria than CA3, but no number or size differences compared to CA1. These data suggest that mitochondria may be differently regulated depending on their location in the cell. With this new finding that mitochondria number and size may be locally regulated, future directions will explore mitochondria and dendritic domains in CA2 that receive different inputs, such as those from CA3 or the entorhinal cortex. Comparing mitochondrial differences between CA2 and its neighboring regions can help us further identify mechanisms underlying CA2's unique role in social memory and how it is possibly linked to autism. And finally, I just want to say thank you to my lab, the Ferris Lab, as well as our home institution, Virginia Tech, and the NIMH.
Thank you, Naisha. Next up, we'll have Honoré Bruton. Hi, everyone. My name is Honoré Bruton. I am a graduate student at UNC Chapel Hill. And today I'll be discussing my research titled Evaluating Astrocyte Activity Following Chronic Intermittent Ethanol Consumption and Drinking in the Dark Procedures. So to briefly touch on the problem with excessive alcohol use, or as I'll be referring to it throughout this talk, ethanol use, some negative short and long-term consequences of excessive drinking include increased risky behavior and accidental injury, an increase in mood disorders, aggression, and violent behavior. Excessive drinking is also associated with heart disease, high blood pressure, and type 2 diabetes, and an increased risk for alcohol dependence, which involves an individual having to consume more alcoholic beverages in order to achieve the same effects. So it's important for us to understand and study the neural mechanisms involved in excessive ethanol drinking. Some neural glial implications that I'm interested in studying include astrocytes, which are glial cells that help maintain synaptic plasticity within neurons, as well as maintaining neurochemicals. Studies show that astrocytes modulate escalating ethanol consumption. And a brain region, the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, or BNST, which as you can see in this diagram, this is a diagram of the rodent brain, and here in the red outline is where the BNST is located as a part of the extended amygdala. This region is known for regulating stress, anxiety, and reward, and studies show that this region is also implicated in modulating ethanol consumption. So my research question is, what are the roles of BNST astrocytes in modulating ethanol consumption? Our lab uses a mouse model, and we have two different drinking paradigms, one being the chronic intermittent ethanol, or CIE, which models a more chronic ethanol exposure, and two is drinking in the dark, or DID, which models a more acute binge-like drinking paradigm. We measured astrocyte activity via glial fibrillary acidic protein immunoreactivity, or GFAP IR. And this is a commonly used structural marker for astrocytes. And in this photomicrograph is a representation of a GFAP staining, showing some of these star-like shapes of astrocytes. So in my results, I did find a significant relationship between ethanol consumption and GFAP immunoreactivity in the BNST. And this finding was particularly seen in male mice. In the CIE study, I found a significant negative correlation between ethanol consumption and GFAP immunoreactivity in that the more animals consumed ethanol, the less GFAP we observed. And here on the left is a total sample showing that correlation. And then by isolating the male samples, you see this effect as well, but not in females, which is not pictured. And in the DID study, I found this interaction where the ethanol drinking males also expressed less GFAP immunoreactivity than water drinking males. So in conclusion, I found that in both chronic intermittent and binge-like ethanol drinking practices, there was a modulation of GFAP immunoreactivity in a sex-dependent manner. This may implicate that astrocytes in the BNST may be a therapeutic target for alcohol use disorder, as well as stress and anxiety disorders. Some future directions that we're interested in exploring include how astrocyte-mediated GABAergic activity modulates ethanol consumption. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the rest of the Thea Lab and the funding from Na the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Thank you. Thank you, Honoré. Next up, we'll have another pre-recorded talk from Andre Toussaint. Hi everyone, 
My name is Honoré Bruton. I am a Good day. My name is Andre Toussaint, and the title of this presentation is called Like Father, Like Son, Paternal Preconception, Chronic Morphine Exposure Causes Maladaptive Behavior Selectively in Male Offspring. Currently, the United States is in the midst of a true opioid epidemic. Over 65 million Americans are exposed to exogenous opiates like morphine each year, and there's a substantial proportion that either misuse or abuse these drugs. But why? Why do some people who experiment with drugs go on to develop substance use disorders while others do not? This is a question that we are trying to address in our lab. We are interested in uncovering the germline epigenetic mechanisms that influence various developmental trajectories in the resulting offspring, and we are studying this through the paternal line. Now you may ask, why study the paternal line? Well, just like in the wild, male rodents are typically not involved in either the gestation nor the rearing of their offspring. So the transmission of their experiences, that is the drugs of abuse, is stored in the genetic as well as epigenetic material in their sperm. The way we are investigating this question is by using our multi-generational model of paternal morphine exposure. Here we expose adult male rodents to morphine for 60 days. Our control group only receives saline. We chose 60 days because that covers the critical period of rat spermatogenesis. Now after the 60 days, we then breed these morphine exposed sires to drug naive dams who then give birth to offspring that we call our morphine sired male and female offspring. Our control group are called saline sired male and female offspring. We then wait until these offspring are adults and we test both groups in morphine self-ministration. And this is what we found. We found that our morphine sired male offspring, they take more morphine than our saline sired controls. This occurred over the course of 10 days at a fixed ratio one schedule of reinforcement where one lever press resulted in one infusion of morphine. After the 10 days, we then switch these animals to a progressive ratio schedule of reinforcement, which requires them to press the lever an increasing number of times for one infusion of morphine. And we found that our morphine side male offspring, they also worked harder for morphine infusions than the saline side controls. This suggests that the reinforcing effects of morphine was heightened in our morphine side male offspring. In a separate group of offspring, we also assessed play behavior when these offspring were adolescents. Now we know that the ability to engage in social play is one of the principal indicators of healthy development, both in humans and in animals. And conversely, deficits in play behavior during adolescence is predictive of adult onset diseases, including substance use disorder. And what we found was that our morphine sired male offspring, they played significantly less than their saline sired counterparts. Specifically, there was a significant decrease in pinning behavior, which is interesting because this is the most characteristic posture and play behavior during this developmental period. Taken together, these results can now be tied back to our previous morphine self-administration results we saw in our adults, and it gives us some insight into the profound impact paternal morphine exposure can have on offspring development. The next steps of this study is to investigate the exact epigenetic mechanisms by which transmission of this phenotype is occurring. Of the many different types of epigenetic mechanisms, DNA methylation, histone modification of chromatin, and small non-coding RNAs are well characterized. Studies are underway in our lab to uncover the potential role of microRNAs that they play in this phenotype because previous studies have shown that they play a functional role in disease heritability. I would like to end by acknowledging my lab and all of the collaborators on this project, as well as my advisor. I would also like to highlight the funding source and thank everyone who has contributed to putting together this Black in Neuroscience mini conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andre, and thank you to everyone in this session.
now we'll take another break for for q a so we're accepting questions Good day. sorry about that we're accepting questions for honore and andre so if you want to go ahead and drop them in the chat then we can answer those live And panelists and judges, you can also ask questions. Okay, I have a question for Honoré. Uh, did you use other markers of astrocyte activation? And did you assess microglial activation as well? So no, I haven't looked at any other astrocyte markers. Um, with GFAT being the most commonly used, that's the only one I've looked at so far. And I haven't looked at um, any microglial assessments either. I am, I am interested in looking at other ways of assessing astrocyte activity though. So if you have any suggestions for what other types of markers or other um, assessments to use, I am willing to take those. Thank you, Anna Ray. We had a question from Matt Wimmer. Do you wanna go ahead and ask that? Hi, very nice talks by everybody. Thank you. Um, this question is for Anna Ray also. I wondered, so you clearly showed some very nice sex differences in your results. I just wondered, at the behavioral level in terms of drinking behavior, um, where there, is there anything there that gives you a clue as to what might be driving the dif differences you saw at the um, astrocyte level? So in my research, we do tend to see sex differences in drinking. Um, it's commonly seen that females consume more alcohol than male rodents do um, as far as GFAP activity goes or astrocyte activity. Um, I've also seen in previous studies where there are sex differences in GFAP immunoreactivity based on both the hormonal sense um, or estrus in an estrus cycle sense and as well as just in males having, in certain regions, males have larger, so there are some different factors that I've seen um, in my, I hope that answered the question. We lost you a little bit at the end. What was the last thing you said? Oh no. Um, I was saying that I've seen multiple uh -huh. reactivity on both the, and based on the estrus cycle and also just male rodents tend to have larger brain region volumes in certain brain regions than females do. Um, so there are multiple factors. Perfect, thank you. That was the, the part that cut out, perfect. Okay, this next question is for Andre. It's from Lee Gilman. He said, fantastic talk, Andre. Do you think this enhanced response to morphine in these rats translates to enhanced responses to other drugs of abuse? That's a great question. Um, we did look at other drugs of abuse, um, like cocaine and nicotine, and we saw that the uh, behavioral effects resulting from uh, paternal morphine exposure was specific to opiates. So there was no difference in the self-administration of cocaine um, and also for nicotine. So it is specific for morphine in these offspring, in the male offspring specifically. Great, thank you, Andre. We had another question for you from Christy Fowler. They asked, does pitting behavior relate to aggression? So play behavior, it is related to aggression, um, particularly when these offspring are adults. So um, they wouldn't really engage in the pinning and pouncing behavior. They were, uh, resulted in these offspring really standing up and boxing, but we didn't look at aggression and um, we didn't see any type of boxing behavior in these offspring when they were adolescents. But again, uh, if we were to look at them during adulthood, then we probably would see uh, a change in behavior that is more aggressive-like. Thank you, Andre. 
This question is for Honoré. Um, what mechanisms do you think might be mediating the sex differences between male and female astrocyte activation? Um, I feel like that could probably have the same answer as I mentioned before. Um, just um, different mechanisms, uh, neural mechanisms between male and female rodents. And that's another reason why I'm interested in like looking at different ways um, of assessing astrocyte activity because astrocytes are involved in so many different functions and it can be, even though GFAP is one common I would say it's not the most efficient way of looking at astrocyte activity. So that's another reason why I'm interested in looking at different ways to measure astrocyte activity and astrocyte activation. Thank you. All right, we have time for one more question. Andre, do you expect that paternal exposure to morphine would influence offspring's drug taking or of other drugs such as cocaine? But I think I just answered that question a minute ago. Um, it is specific, specific to um, morphine. Okay. Um, okay, we'll take one more for you, Andre. Do you think that the pinning behavioral deficit will be inherited in the F2 generation? Can the memory be inherited in a multi-general fashion? That is a beautiful, beautiful question. Um, we have yet to go on into the F2 generation, but if we were to see um, a perpetuation of this behavior into the F2 generation, then it would start telling us that there is something that is being transmitted um, through the sperm and it's traveling through the male germline and it's affecting these offspring. But that's a, that's a question uh, that we can investigate uh, later on. We have yet to go on to the F2 generation for right now in the F1 generation. Okay, thank you so much, Andre and Andre, and thank you to all of the amazing speakers that we've had. We're gonna take a quick, it's about three to four minute break, and then we'll start with the next group of speakers. Thank you.
All right. Thank you so much for waiting. We'll go ahead and get started with our next session. I'm so excited for our next group of speakers. We, before we get to them, I wanted to again introduce our judges. We have Dr. Yuval Silberman, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Neural and Behavioral Sciences at Penn State. His research focuses on emotional regulation pathways and how they are altered by chronic drug abuse and stress. Our next judge is Dr. Kaliris Salas, a distinguished medical lecturer at the CUNY School of Medicine, where her research focuses on sex-specific interventions for cognitive decline as a result of developmental drug exposure. Our next judge is Dr. Gregory Samanez Larkin, and he is the, the Jack H. Neely Associate Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Duke, with expertise in age-related motivation and cognition, decision-making, and health behavior across the lifespan. Our final judge is Dr. Yolan Smith, who's the Division Chief of Neuropharmacology and Neurological Diseases at Yerkes National Primate Research Center. Thank you so much for being here. Without further ado, I will go ahead and hand it over to our first speaker, John C. Oyem. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Chukuma Oyem, and I'm from Nigeria. I'll be presenting um, oh, um, a topic on nicotine exerts histomorphological changes in the cerebellar cortex of adult male visteracts. Next slide, please. That's why the Federal Ministry of Health warnings that smokers are liable to die young, yet people to venture into the use of tobacco and cigarette smoking. And it will be interesting to know that tobacco smoking is one of the persistent and widespread addictions that is driven by nicotine. And nicotine itself is a potent practice in part to mimatic alkaloid that is found in the roots in the roots of nine shades of plants. It is also found in some vegetables such as uh, tomatoes, eggplants, and and potatoes. The um, average amount of nicotine in the tobacco rod is about um, 1.0 uh, 10 milligram to 14 uh, milligram, and nicotine is circulated to the brain in as little as seven seconds after inhalation. Then, so many studies have showed uh, some of the adverse effects of cigarette smoking in the body system, whereas others have also highlighted its beneficial effects. And this has led to several controversies. It might also be surprising to know that nicotine is an, it's also addictive as heroin and cocaine. This is because of the numerous interactions it has with the reward system of the brain, which is the mesolimbic pathway. Next slide. So for this, um, for, for this particular, please next slide. For this particular study, we're interested in looking at the, um, the effects of oral ingested low dose administration of nicotine on the histology and cell count analysis of the cerebellum. Nicotine itself is an agonist of the nicotinic uh, the uh, uh, nicotinic uh, receptors. It's an agonist of it, and the nicotinic receptors some are located in the neuromuscular junction, whereas some like the alpha seven. Uh, receptors and the alpha beta subtype are located in the cerebellum. And in some chronic uh, cigarette smokers, studies have shown that they have these um, postural in imbalances. And we're particularly interested in looking at cerebellum in the way that if some of these smokers are having postural imbalances, what is happening to the cerebellum? And also, and from where I come from in Nigeria, nicotine has been used um, as a concussion with, uh, with, uh, to treat epilepsy. So that's why we decided to look at this effect of nicotine on the cerebellum. Next slide, please. So our, our study was strictly an experimental study that um, involved the use of nicotine and nicotine was purchased from a shop, taking into details the manufacturer details, the expiry dates, and our route of drug administration was oral. Why oral? Now, some of the uh, uh, some of the tobacco products are taken via the oral routes. For instance, we have the snuff, and even uh, some nicotine replacement therapies like the oral, uh, like the gums and the lozenges are also taken via oral. So we are trying to mimic that. And our time of administration was 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. This was to maintain a steady concentration of nicotine in the blood because nicotine has um, a high half-life of two to three hours, and after three hours, it has its it has been cleared by the kidney. So we wanted to maintain a steady concentration. And the vehicle of transport was water, our sample size was 24, and the animals were divided into four groups. We had our controls and other groups that were given two milligram per kg, four milligram per kg, and six milligram per kg. Taking into fact that the LD50 for nicotine was 50 milligram, 50 milligram per, uh, per kg. So we also did this because, like I told you, an average tobacco road contains 10 to 14 milligram per 
uh, 10 to 14 milli, uh, milligrams of nicotine. So we tried to mimic the this uh, the particular dodos. So for our study, we tried to demonstrate a dose and time dependent effect of nicotine. So uh, during our, our routinic series, we utilized at the end of seven, 21 and, 40, and 42 days. Of course, at the end of the routinic, I will have the brain and stained and processed using standard histological pro uh, processes. Then we did the cell count analysis via the optical dissector principle. In the optical dissector principle, you have the, the green line and the red line. So it's an unbiased form of serology that so that any cells or cell body that touches the red lines are not counted. However, cells that touches um, the green line or falls in between the, the green lines are counted. This is to prevent counting uh, the neuronal cell bodies. So, I, so at the end of the analysis, we we'll passed it to a statistical software, XPSS, using one way and another, and we'll further use a Toki postdoc test to determine the mean significances between groups. So for for our histology results, next slide, please. So for our, our, our histology results, these are sections of the cerebellum showing the molecular layer, the granular layer, of course, and of course the single layer of the Purkinje uh, of the Purkinje cells. So the Purkinje. So when you look at the dif differences between the seven days for the controlled group two, group three, group four, there were no. There were there were no uh, neuro, uh, neuronal degenerations. Rather, we discovered. Uh, Effective adaptive changes. We discovered increase in cellularity, and this increase in cellularity, we named them mild, moderate, and uh, severe hyperplasia. And when we, when we compare them, like in the molecular layer, molecular layer is, is made up of sparse cells, and the, the, uh, the deeply basophilic granular layer is made up of lots of granular cells and the sticky Purkinje cells. And across the group, there was a dose. With increase in tools, there was increase in cellularity across the group, and with increase, and um, and with also and with increase in time, there was also increase in cellularity. That is, as for seven, when we, when we went to twenty one days, there was dose dependent effects and a time dependent effect. So it was so surprising. So we decided to okay for us to um, estimate this increase in cellularity. We decided to do a cell count. Next slide. Next slide. So for our cell counts, we counted our cere uh, cerebral neurons at the end of seven days, 21 and 42 days. And we discovered that there was also a significant increase in the cells of the molecular layer, Purkinje layer, and the granular layer in day seven. And they were all significant. And what we counted for the cells of day 21 using our optical dissector principle, we also discovered that who had a significant increase of the molecular in the molecular layer, Purkinje layer, and the highest response was seen in the groups that received six, mill, uh, six milligram per kg. But however, in the granular layer, we also recorded significant differences. But the group that received four milligram per kg was not significant. They also estimated the effects of nicotine on the cerebral cortex for the animals that received nicotine, loads of nicotine for 42 days. We also had interesting results, also had significant changes. Next slide, please. So for results, nicotine induces a time and dose dependent significant increase in cellularity in the cerebrum of adult twister rats, cerebral neuronal cell counts, and Purkinje diameter. So we concluded that oral exposure of nicotine displays proliferative adaptive changes in the cerebrum in a dose and time dependent manner. This implies that nicotine containing vegetables may possess beneficial effects in the brain. And for future studies, next slide, for our future studies, for future studies, we are aimed at looking at the particular mechanism that might be responsible for these. And we also want to investigate if nicotine may possess a neurogenesis potential. So I want to acknowledge my my supervisors and all those who collaborated for this research and also black in neuroscience for this wonderful mini conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. As a reminder for people just joining us, we'll have four speakers in this in this sub session and then afterwards we'll do Q&A for all of them. So if you have a question for any of our speakers, if you could just drop it into the Q&A and then indicate who it's for, I'll ask it live during the Q&A session. Next up, we have Alana Williams. Um, good afternoon. My name is Alana Williams. I'm a second year master's student at Nova Southeastern University. And today my presentation is about examining enzyme replacement therapy for CLN2 disease using human neuroprogenerative cells. 
Uh, next slide, please. So CLE2 is a lysosomal storage disorder that results in a deficit of the digestive enzyme TPP1. Without this enzyme, cells begin to accumulate waste and over time lose function and die. Children are typically diagnosed around age two and have a life expectancy of about eight to 10 years. TPP1 was confirmed as the missing enzyme in CLN2 in 1998 and was isolated in 2000. Intraceribroventricular delivery of TPP1 was successful in a mouse model of CLN2 in 2007. And while the mice were not cured, they did observe increased motor movement and life expectancy. So the FDA approved this method of delivery of TPP1 as treatment in humans for CLN2 in 2016. Next slide, please. So the clinical trial with Brineura is set to begin taking patients in December of this year. And the method of delivery is through intracranial cannula, and it is a 300 milligram dose of TPP1 on a biweekly basis. Diffusion models suggest that once injected into the lateral ventricle, TPP1 will flow throughout the, br the brain along a concentration gradient, suggesting that the cells lining the lateral ventricles will receive the highest concentrations of TPP1. Some, some concerns about the efficacy of this method of delivery to the rest of the brain tissue has been raised. However, this remains that the cells lining the ventricle will be receiving the highest dose. Next slide. So our experimental design involves exposing human neuroprogenitor cells to increasing concentrations of TPP1, starting with 0.1 micrograms per mil and the highest being 100 micrograms per mil, and we will be examining cell death and proliferation. Next slide. So we exposed our cells to these various concentrations of TPP1 over a 24 hour incubation period. And we observed significant cell death at the highest concentration, which was 100 micrograms per mil. It should be noted that these cells are normal functioning cells that are readily producing TPP1, unlike those of a CLN2 patient. CLN2 patient cells will likely express little to no TPP1 and would therefore likely be able to withstand the concentrations that we have here without experiencing the same level of cell death. However, as I stated, the Brineura dosage is 300 milligrams and the, those cells lining the ventricle are going to be receiving the highest concentration of that dose, which is, far, which is likely to be beyond what normal cells produce on a regular basis, as well as what our cells were exposed to in vitro. Next slide, please. So another way that we are looking at if increased levels of TPP1 alter neurogenesis is by exposing cells to adenovirus, expressing either TPP1 and EGFP alone or, EG, or EGFP as a control. Here you can see some cells that were transduced with EGFP and some baseline cell death. This data is currently being quantified in conjunction with cells that are overexpressing TPP1. This will allow us to determine if high levels of TPP1 alter um, differentiation potential in these cells as well when compared to normal neuroprogenitor cells. We were able to determine proliferation rates and differentiate and maturation um, profiles on these normal cells using EDU proliferation assay. Um, the neuroprogenitor marker Nestin, the, neuro, the, the neuronal progenitor marker double cortin, as well as the astrocyte marker EGF, the astrocyte marker GFAP. The outcome of our study is to, the desire for the outcome of this study is for our data to improve neurological assessments for CLN2 patients undergoing this method of enzyme replacement therapy. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you so much, Alana. Next up, we have Corey J. White. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'm gonna to tell you about a project that we recently uh, published where we're looking at the basic capacity for fatty acids to be utilized within the brain. Uh, next slide, please. So historically, people typically think about fatty acids um, being used in the brain. What's normally considered are glucose and ketone bodies as energy substrates. However, fatty acids, when uh, there are genetic perturbations of fatty acid oxidation genes, 
there are neurologic perturbations that have been associated, um, such as depression and autism spectrum disorders. And fatty acid oxidation within the brain itself has been hotly contested for decades. It's uh, been thought that in the past that uh, the specific activities uh, such as um, some of the major fatty acid oxidation enzymes uh, have much lower specific activities in comparison to highly oxidated tissues such as skeletal muscle and heart and heart. Uh, next slide, please. However, there's also been evidence that fatty acid oxidation can occur, at least in vitro. Um, astrocytes actually express all the enzymes necessary for fatty acid oxidation, as well as uh, there's been support that in culture, labeled uh, fatty acids or radio labeled fatty acids are able to be broken down um, by brain tissue and culture. Uh, next slide, please. So typically, when uh, fatty acids come into uh, mitochondria for oxidation, they require a series of activation steps in order to be utilized. And by loss of the enzyme carnitine polymetyltransferase 2 or CPT2, we uh, can see that there is a blockage in the final stage in order to bring fatty acids to acylcarnitines to acyl-CoA in which they're broken down. Next slide. And actually in Drosophila, in a CPT2 knockout, there has been seen evidence that accumulation of um, lipid droplets, which is indicative that with this uh, CPT2 loss, there's accumulation of some of these fatty acid um, intermediates, showing they are being accumulated and mobilized for oxidation, but they can't be. Next slide. Next slide, please. And so our major question is, will we see this uh, same phenomena within uh, a mammalian system as well. Next slide. And so our question is, while it's known that the brain can oxidize supplied fatty acids, how much fatty acid oxidation is occurring within the brain under normal circumstances? And we hypothesize that if fatty acids are normally oxidized within the brain, then loss of the obligate fatty acid oxidation enzyme, CPT2, will result in accumulations of this activated form of fatty acids, which is known as acylcarnitines. So next slide, please. So to study this, we uh, actually generated a conditional knockout mouse that's lost the inability to oxidize fatty acids through loss of CPT2, specifically within the brain. And as you can see on the left here, you can see substantial loss of CPT2 expression in several brain regions. And on the right, you see here is a radio labeled uh, assay where we can see functional, functionally, there's a loss in the utilization of fatty acids from wild types on the left to knockouts on the right. So next slide. And this is just uh, highlighted through animations. And next slide, please. So there's that loss within uh, the knockout as well. But majorly, what is the major finding here uh, through some global metabolomics was after uh, putting um, our wild type, as well as our brain knockout, as well as several other controls, we did global metabolomics. And on the left here is what's called a principal component analysis, which is majorly a summation of all of the data. And as you see here, the blue is our brain knockout, where that is segregating further from the others. But on the right, what we want to highlight is anywhere from an eight to a 40-fold increase in those acylcarnitines, showing they're being mobilized for fatty acid oxidation. So next slide. And that's also just uh, recapitulated through MALDI imaging. As you can see here on the left with the wild type, and to the right, there's that accumulation as well. So next slide. So in summary, we see that there is this accumulation of acylcarnitine. So forward to next slide, please. Where, next slide, we see this major accumulation as you can see those acylcarnitines and greens are being accumulated. Sure, they're being mobilized to be broken down, but can't be broken down from our model. And I would just like to thank uh, all of my lab and um, all of my collaborators and the BCMB program, as well as uh, show my references in the next slide. And thank you all to Black and Neuro. Thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you so much, Corey. Next up, we have Taylor Phillips Jones. Hello, everyone. My name is Taylor Phillips Jones, and I am a senior undergraduate student at Howard University. And I work in the Richardson Lab at the Howard University College of Medicine. And today, I'll be talking about my project involving 
the activation of the paraventricular nucleus of the thalamus in a binge eating rodent model. Next slide. So first I'm gonna discuss what binge eating is. So binge eating is described as the excessive consumption of food that is typically high in fat or sugar in a limited amount of time. So more than the normal person would consume in that same amount of time. And in some cases, individuals can be classified as having binge eating disorder in which they have recurrent episodes of binge eating at least one to two times a week for a period of at least three months. And BED is important because it is the most common eating disorder in the United States. And interestingly, it has a greater prevalence in females. Next slide. So our area of interest for this experiment is the paraventricular nucleus of the thalamus. And this is chosen because it functions as a communication center between different regions of the brain that are involved in motivated behaviors and reward processing. And studies have shown that it has been linked to increased food intake, which is why we're using it in this feeding behavior study. Um, so this diagram below shows different regions that project to the PVT and different regions that the PVT project to. So some regions that um, project to the PVT include the lateral hypothalamus, the hypothalamus, the pelvic cortex, and the ventral tegmental area. And the notable region that the PVT neurons send projections to is the nucleus accumbens. Next slide. So um, for the experiment, we did a total of nine feeding tests. In each feeding test, rats were individually housed and had access to chow and high fat sweet palatable food in a different portion of the cage. And the weights of the chow and PF were taken one hour and four hours after the palatable food was introduced to the cage. And then after that four hour time point, the palatable food was removed. And during, between each feeding test, we had two to three days where they just um, had access to regular chow. So then after the feeding tests were completed, we determined what the phenotypes of the rats were. And we divided them into two groups, binge eating resistant or BER and binge eating prone or BEP. So we used the amount of palatable food recorded at the four hour time point to assign the rats. So we um, organized them from the lowest intake to the highest intake. And the rats that were in the upper third um, of the PF intake were labeled as binge eating prone and those within the lower third were labeled as binge eating resistant. And um, we, since we did a total of nine tests, if the rats classified as binge eating prone for at least five, they were then labeled as binge eating prone for analysis. And those within the lower third for at least five of the tests were labeled as binge eating resistant. So the animals were perfused 90 minutes after the final feeding test. And then the brains were isolated and frozen and double label immunohistochemistry was done to stain for erexin and CFOS. And then afterwards, the sections were observed under the microscope and the CFOS positive cells were counted using Venpro and ImageJ software. Next slide. So specifically with this project, we didn't want to just look at the PVT activation, but we wanted to compare two different regions of the PVT. So the anterior or APVT versus the posterior PPVT. So the APVT has been shown to send more projections to the prefrontal cortex, as well as some projections to the nucleus accumbens shell, while the PPVT has sent more projections to the amygdala, and it projects to both the nucleus accumbens shell and core. And studies have shown that activation of the PPVT has been linked to increased sucrose seeking. So these images on the bottom show what we used for quantifying the cells. So these are atlas pictures on the left of each of the microscope pictures. And for the APVT region, we use the negative 1.72 millimeters from Bregma point. And for the PPVT, we use the negative 3.48 millimeters from Bregma point. And in the microscope pictures, the erexin um, terminals are labeled using this like brown color in the pictures. And the CFOS are these darker um, black circles. And what was interesting is that the vexin is used specifically because it outlines the region of the PVT. So as you can see, the APVT and PPVTs di um, differ in the shape of the region. Next slide. So our preliminary results um, are on this slide. So first, I'm going to talk about the feeding phenotype comparison. And as you can see in the top left, that the binge eating prone rats did consume significantly more palatable food than the binge eating resistance, as we expected. And then we also have two comparisons between the different regions. So at the bottom left, we see the topographical comparison in which we have the same phenotype of rat in the different regions. And we see that the, um, there isn't much difference between the two um, regions within the same phenotype. Um, however, looking at the top in the activational comparison, we do see a significant difference between the PPVT when looked at in different phenotypes of rats. So overall, we do see that these different regions are activated as a result of the binge eating behavior, 
and that indicated by the activational comparison graph that the PPBT may play a more critical role in binge eating behavior than the APBT. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taylor. And thank you to Corey, Alana, and John. At this point, we'll take questions for all four of them. So if you wanna drop those into the Q&A, and if you could just remember to indicate the person for which the question is for, that'd be great. Okay, um, so we have a question for Taylor. Someone said, really interesting. Do you know if the composition of the diet has a big influence? I.e., if you would have either high fat or high sugar instead of both, would you expect a different result? Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, definitely there are some studies that have just done fat and have just done sugar. The results are pretty similar between them. For our study, we decided to do both just because the typical binge diet does include both, but I would expect a similar result from the high fat and high sugar um, experiments as well. Thank you. Another question for Taylor. Can you speculate about whether previous exposure to a stressor before exposure to PF might impact neuronal activation of orexin neurons in the PBT? Thank you for your question. I do think that stress would impact the um, neural activation of orexin just because of the stress response is correlated to um, the function of orexin. However, for this current um, experiment, we did not look at the effects of stress, but that is definitely something to consider in the future. Thanks. And another one for Taylor. Uh, they said, great presentation. Have you ever worked with male rats? Yes. So for the experiment I talked about today, we just did the female rats just because female rat, um, human in humans that are female, um, binge eating is more common. But there have been experiments with male rats in the lab, and we see that they still do have um, the binge eating prone and binge eating resistant phenotypes. But interestingly, the binge eating prone male rats consume significantly less than the binge eating prone female rats. So there is a difference um, mimicked in rats as there is in humans. Thank you, Taylor. Um, we had a question about what technique was used to access global metabolomics. Um, is it mass spec based? Uh, yes, yeah, so actually we did um, actually a couple of methodologies of mass spec. So um, we, for the global mass spec is a combination of GCMS, it's a combination of LCMS. Um, and following that global metabolomics that was actually validated through some targeted LCMS as well. Great, thank you. Another question for Taylor. Uh, did you have to, or how long did you account for hunger variants among the rats? So um, specifically with that, we mostly just compared it in terms of the test. So we did nine different tests to kind of get the feeding patterns of the rats. Um, also in the data, the PF intake is balanced over the weights of the animals. So that kind of play, uh, goes into play there. But for specifically comparing the hunger variants between them, we didn't um, investigate that. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? We also can take some from the judges as well. Now's your chance. Okay, I have one for John. Uh, what do you plan to do next to follow up your work? Okay, uh, thank you so much. I, this is really interesting. Although um, the neuroscience like, laboratory in Nigeria, it's limited with some continuity techniques, but um, we're tend looking for collaboration to understand um, the specific mechanism. Then we're also instead looking at the genetic, uh, genesis potentials, if maybe on administration of low dose of nicotine can actually um, induce neurogenesis. We also intend looking at synaptic plasticity. And because um, this is a, a preliminary study, we also looked at um, the hippocampus and we discovered a similar similar observation as that of the cerebellum. So we intend to maybe further look at um, how it can affect me memory, learning, and um, cognition and see if it can be a viable therapeutic target to mitigate um, some of the neurogenerative diseases. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Alana. One person would love to hear you talk a little bit about the implications of this treatment for patient populations. Hi, yes, this is a great question. Um, so the way that they assess 
um, treatment in the clinical trial, it just finished their um, efficacy and safety trials before they move into uh, taking patients for the clinical trial. And one of the ways that they assess efficacy of the treatment is for um, motor movement and uh, motor abilities. And so, but they don't really see much cognitive improvement. And getting the data from this and understanding how this type of treatment affects the cells, it gives it gives the uh, the the clinicians a better outcome expectation for the for their patients, and leads to better outcomes for their assessments and more accurate outcomes for their assessments. Great, thank you, Alana. We one more question for you. By using an animal model to look at neurogenesis, do you think the same markers can translate to humans? Oh, I'm not using an animal model. I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. I'm using human neuroprogenitor cells. Great, thank you. All right, well, this concludes our Q&A session. Um, thank you so much to all of our incredible speakers. And um, yeah, we really appreciate you. That was awesome, thank you so much. All right, and we, okay, next up we have some pre recorded talks. So we'll go ahead and move on to those. And same goes if you have questions for any of our speakers, you can go ahead and drop them in the chat and just indicate who that question is for. So next up we have Wetness Anastol, who will actually be unavailable for questions, but for everyone else, drop them in the chat. Hi, my name is Whitney Anastal. I'm here from the University of Florida, and I'm here to present a project that's still ongoing, and it's examining the interactions between cetriaxone and volunteer abstinence on relapse to cocaine-seeking and involved circuitry with volunteer abstinence and relapse. So cocaine use disorder is characterized by high rates of relapse even after long periods of abstinence, Contingency management is a behavioral treatment where patients with cocaine use disorder are offered non-drug rewards in exchange for maintained drug absences. And these non-drug rewards are usually money or gift cards. It is highly successful at inducing absence. However, once discontinued, most patients relapse back to drug use. Circuitry underlying relapse following contingency management is not well established in the voluntary absence model aims to mimic this human condition in rodents. So, so far there hasn't been any studies with VA on cocaine use disorder, but there has been animal models on methamphetamine, self-administration, and a few opioid studies. Cetraxone is an antibiotic that reliably attenuates relapse of cocaine seeking after 14 and 21 days of abstinence across behavioral paradigms. And this is the breakthrough that my PI, Dr. Naxta, discovered with her colleagues is that cetraxone can prevent relapse after 14 and 21 days of abstinence. Our purpose is to test the ability of cetraxone to reduce cocaine-seeking voluntary abstinence and during a relapse test. So this is our behavioral paradigm. We had a total of 25 rats. They all underwent sucrose self-administration followed by jugular catheter surgery. And after that, they underwent cocaine self-administration. So the jugular catheter surgery is just, um, just to get the cocaine confused into their bodies, just like in the second picture right there. In the sucrose self-administration, we used a white house light instead of the yellow house light that's shown in the picture. And there's five sucrose pellets for delivery, a red Q light, which lasts about five seconds, as you can see in the box, and a 20-second level retracted period. It was like a timeout, like a 20-second 20, 20 timeout, like when they press the lever, so they can't keep constantly pressing the lever. And they have to meet the criteria of five days of 15-plus lever presses with 80%, with more than 80% consumption rate. With cocaine self-administration, we used a blue lead, how, lead light, and five seconds cocaine infusion delivery. It's accompanied by a tone and white cue light and a 20 second lever retracted timeout. And an inactive lever is available. That inactive lever 
there's no consequences for pressing that lever we just record them and the rats had to meet a criteria of 12 days of 10 plus infusion following cocaine self-administration we split the rats into voluntary or forced abstinence and abstinence lasts about 14 days well not about 14 days and following abstinence we have we give them cetraxone and a vehicle or a vehicle so the voluntary absence it's the voluntary absence that are given the cetraxone or the vehicle um forced abstinence they do not go back in the operant chambers they do not go back into the boxes they go back to their cages and they're handled daily um but the voluntary absence how we're gonna test the the efficacy of cetraxone in attenuating the relapse and then following that we have a relapse test So these two graphs show that there are no group differences in pellet training or drug training. The graph on the bottom shows that there, in the at the, in the beginning, more rats were performing cocaine, but after day two, you see that more rats start to prefer the sucrose over the cocaine, which is significant because no other research has found that the rats were favoring the drug at all. Most of them found that the the rats were favoring sucrose because you know rats really love sugar but this one was really good because it shows a reluctance to move from cocaine here this is the results of the cocaine relapse test here it shows that there's no significant difference between the lever presses and with the groups and here this shows a there's a correlation between um, cocaine intake during VA training um, and relapse and cocaine tips with relapse here, it shows that the with VA and cetraxone, this correlation is disrupted. With cetraxone, you see no correlation between cocaine infusions and relapse. So this is our FOSS results. It's an immediate early gene that responds to a significant stimulus. It serves as a neurological marker, and it tells us which brain regions is more active in a certain place or time. And here the vehicle, VA has higher expression of CFOS than the VA cetraxone, may, may imply that cetraxone reduces the levels. And here the ventral tegmental area implying cetraxone treatment can induce CFOS expression. So unlike previous studies, we observed resistance in transitioning from drug to sucrose. We show that the rats have a clear preference by the end of the VA or either reinforcer. In vehicle-treated animals, total amount of cocaine taken during VA positively correlated with relapse, indicating behavioral during abstinence influence relapse. Cetraxone treatment disrupts this correlation and induces higher CFOS expression in the VTA compared to other groups. VA alone induces CFOS expression in the VOFC compared to the FA controls, indicating the higher engagement of VOFC during relapse, depending on how abstinence was achieved. And that concludes our presentation. Though we're still doing more CFOS studies in the future, but this is our conclusion for now. Thank you so much, Whitney's. Next up, we have another pre recorded talk from Janae Baker. Greetings, everyone. I'm Janae Baker, a second year honor psychology student at North Carolina AT State University. Today, I will be doing a presentation on adolescent female C57BL-6J mice show increased alcohol consumption following chronic intermittent stress exposure. Many adolescents report experiencing stress from relationships, school, work, or even family life. Stressors can come in many forms, whether they are subliminal or overt. Overall, stress has been linked to an increase in anxiety. Studies have shown that men and women abuse alcohol to cope with anxiety. The present research was conducted to determine the effects of intermittent stress exposure on voluntary alcohol consumption in adolescent female mice. It was hypothesized that the chronic stress exposure during adolescence would severely increase voluntary alcohol intake behavior in these mice. Because this behavior occurs during a critical developmental period, it can impact long-term behavior and 90% of alcohol voluntarily consumed by adolescents is in a binge drinking. Our subjects for this experiment were 20 female mice in the adolescent age group. We have a stress group and a non-stress control group with each group consisting of 10 mice. 
The mice arrived on postnatal day 21 and received an acclimation period of one week. Chronic stress exposure began on postnatal day 28, behavioral testing began on postnatal day 42, and voluntary alcohol intake measurements began on postnatal day 52. On postnatal day 28 to 29, 32 to 33, 36 to 37, and 40 to 41, mice were exposed to stress. The stress exposure was a restraint and lasted two hours. Between each exposure day, the mice were left undisturbed. 24 hours after the last stress exposure, all mice underwent the marble bearing test to measure anxiety-like behavior. After a week of rest, the mice were individually housed and exposed to ethanol on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday using a two-bottle two weeks. The marble bearing test was 30 minutes and included 20 equally spaced marbles. The results, results were calculated by determining how many marbles they buried. For the anxiety-like behavior and weight measurements, we saw no significant differences between the stress and non-stress groups, indicating stress does not increase anxiety-like behavior or determine any weight loss or gain. We've also included photos before and after the marble bearing test. The exposure to alcohol was intermittently administered for 24-hour periods on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for two weeks. Regarding ethanol intake, we noticed that the stress group had less variation in the amount of alcohol they consumed, and they continued to consume more alcohol than the non-stress control group. We also saw that preference for concentration of alcohol was higher among the stress group, and the non-stress group showed more variation in preference level. These patterns of variation may have been created because of other factors non-related to stress. The results indicate that stress does increase the amount of alcohol consumed and create a preference for higher alcohol concentration. To conclude, the experiment did not determine any differences in anxiety-like behavior or weight between the control and the stress group. The control group showed oscillations in ethanol consumption. However, the stress group's alcohol consumption remained constant. It was also determined that the stress group voluntarily consumed more alcohol than their counterparts. This may indicate chronic stress exposure does have an effect on one's tendency to consume alcohol. This was our first attempt to pilot this experiment, intermittent stress paradigm. Although we do not have the data indicating that the intermittent stress exposure altered anxiety-like behavior or weight during adolescence, our data supports the hypothesis that early chronic intermittent stress exposure does alter ethanol intake in adolescent female mice. This experiment was designed to model our recent work using a similar pattern of binge ethanol exposure that was shown to alter voluntary ethanol consumption. It's clear more work is needed as we did not see robust changes in these behaviors. We will continue to make changes to the design of the experiment, including, but not limited to, different withdrawal periods, more stress exposures, and different measures of anxiety-like behavior. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Janae. Next up, we have our last talk of the session, and this is our selected talk. So we're looking forward to hearing from Iabo Arankitola. Thank you. Iabo, I don't think we can hear. Have some feedback, but not you. Could just hang tight for a little bit. In the meantime, if you have any questions for Janae, if you want to go ahead and drop them into the chat. Okay, uh, Iabo is gonna exit and come back and hopefully that'll fix her sound. In the meantime, we'll go ahead and do Q&A for Janae. So Janae, if you're ready, <laughs> sorry, I know that was unanticipated. Um, I already have one question for you. It was, did you have other behavioral measures other than the marble bearing that showed stress effects?
Good morning. The marble bearing test was the only one we used to measure anxiety like stress behaviors. Thank you. Do you have any other questions for Janae while we wait? Someone asked uh, for Janae, do you plan to try other stressors in the future? Yes, we do want to expand the experiment to include other stressors and other measures of stress-related tests. So not just the restraint test, not just the restraint test, but we also want to see how we can measure if they're stressed or their level of stress. Hmm. Yeah, oh yeah, we're just picking up feedback. Yeah, just stream robot sounds. Sorry about that. Yeah, someone suggested maybe calling in, seeing if, if that'll work. Sometimes the computer audio gets funny. Yeah, we can still take any questions for, for Janae. For Janae, how did you quantify the level of stress in this experiment? The level of stress was quantified by how many marbles they buried. So there were 20 equally spaced marbles and we counted how many each mouse buried to determine their level of stress. Great, thank you. Hi, can you all hear me now? Oh, we can. Oh, sure. oh, perfect. Okay, I'm on my phone, but that's no problem at all. Okay, great. Okay, okay I'm ahead. ready to get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Yabba Antotola. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Today, I'll be giving a talk titled The Microbiota Modulates CNS Transcription and Disease Progression in an ALS Animal Model. Um, this research was conducted for completion of my thesis from Harvard University in Howard Weiner's Neurology Lab at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Thank you for having me. Let's get started. Next, please. ALS is a neurodegenerative disease of the motor neurons of the brain and spinal cord. Patients present typically with um, progressive muscle weakness and on average die three to five years after diagnosis typically because of um, respiratory muscle failure. Um, many neurodegenerative diseases are associated with protein aggregates and inclusion formation. ALS is um, one of those. Pathology includes the accumulation of protein aggregates and there are multiple protein degradation pathways that are associated with this, including impaired RNA splicing, the ubiquitin proteasome system, um, which tags these aggregates and the autolysosomal pathway, which um, degrades or gets rid of these pathways. Um, from an epidemiological standpoint, ALS is 10% um, of cases are familial and associated with um, genes, including FUSE, SQSCM1, um, C9ORF, and SOD1. And that means that about 90% of disease of patients with this disease, um, it occurs sporadically, which indicates that there's an environmental contributing factor. And I think that the microbiome, the gut microbiome can be one of those contributing factors. Next, please. Okay. So um, our collaborators, um, Dr. Katie Nicholson and James Berry, um, an incredible group at MGH, they found that patients, ALS patients have an altered microbiome. And more specifically, they have um, depleted bacteria that produce butyrate. So we kind of see that um, ALS patients do have an altered microbiota. Next, please. This can be, um, the microbiota can be manipulated by different interactions. It can be depleted in germ-free mice or through antibiotics or it can be, um, we can add to it through a microbiota transplant or single multiple uh, bacteria, which we do. You can also do it through co-housing because mice are copophagic and um, they eat poop. So um, really one of our questions was, does the microbiota from sod, 
Oh, next, please. Next, please. So we asked the question, does microbiota from sod one mice modulate microglia expression? We investigated this by giving a group of wild type mice and eradicating the microbiome over three days with antibiotics. We allowed one day for um, the antibiotics to leave circulation. We administered it through um, water. And after that one day, we colonized um, the microbiome with the microbiota from wild type or sod one mice. We treated the mice twice for four weeks and we sorted the microglia and did RNA sequencing and we did 16S RNA sequencing to characterize the bacteria in the gut. Next, please. What we found, um, if you look at panel B, it shows a heat map of genes altered by the SOD1 microbiota. The panel on the right is the brain and the panel on the left is spinal cord microglia. And um, if you focus on panel C, this kind of zooms in on some of the genes that we found. Um, next, please. Um, one thing that we found is some of the genes that were involved in, um, we see an upregulation of genes involved in the protein misfolding and aggregate clearing. So in panel C, you can see um, that the RNA processing um, and Fuse and SQSTM1, uh, those are two of the genes that were associated with familial ALS. We see an upregulation of those, which is um, really interesting because again, these are wild type mice and all we did was change the microbiome. Next, please. We also see a difference in um, genes associated with protein degradation. This heat shock protein one, AB, um, stabilizes proteins against aggregation. And we see that that is downregulated in the mice that receive the SOD1 microbiota and um, two other genes, the XBP1 and the ubiquitin um, gene are upregulated. And this is interesting because like we talked about yesterday the, or earlier, the UPS um, ubiquitin proteasome system is important for labeling those misfolded proteins. And we see the, in the bottom panel, the autophagy lysosomal system, we see those genes upregulated as well. So again, we see genes involved in protein misfolding and aggregate formation in ALS upregulated in wild type mice simply from um, changing the microbiome. Next, please. So um, here, this is our 16S rRNA data. Um, we sequenced the microbiome to see what was going on. In day 36, we see a decrease in biodiversity, and this is um, as we expected, because we, again, treated with antibiotics, we see a lot of different changes. But um, if you look at day 56, that is the end of the experiment. And we see greater biodiversity and difference between the NTC or control and the SOD, um, and the SOD microbiota treated mice. Next, please. So if you look at this panel down to the left, we can see that the, there is a decrease in the relative abundance of acromantia. Next, please. Acromantia is a mucin degrading bacteria in the intestine, and it seems to have protective effects in other diseases, including obesity, diabetes, um, SOD1, and other animal models. So we're wondering if acromantia has a sort of protective effect in the SOD1 mouse. Next, please. So for our next experiment, we actually got SOD1 mice and we treated with single or a bacteria cocktail. The vehicle is our control group, um, a glycerol mock sock, and um, we treated one group with acromantia and one group with a cocktail of butyrate producing microbes um, as suggested by our collaborators when the depleted butyrate producing microbes in ALS patients. We did, um, this experiment lasted about five or six months. We did one treatment um, a week of the bacteria. We weekly monitored um, behavioral testing and through the rotor rod. This is a test that kind of measures motor function and coordination. If the mice falls off the wheel before it's time, that's considered a latency to fall. And um, we measured that. And if you, next please, if you look on the right, we can see that the mouse um, 
there's a little video, we can see a mouse with decreased motor function as it, as it progresses and you can see it kind of toppling over, um, just a visual. So um, if you look at the bottom panel, we can see, wait, the dashed line at the top is our control mice and um, the non-transgenic -con control, so the non-sod mice, and we see they're pretty heavy. Um, with all the mice being a little bit together, um, paired together in the beginning around day 84, we can see that the mice that were treated with the bacteria are heavier, which is um, a good sign in a muscle degenerative disease. We also measured latency to fall in the second panel, and we see that they all kind of start around 200 seconds. But as the disease progresses, the black line or the vehicle control group um, fall off faster than our treated mice, which again is a good sign. And if you look at our neurological score graph, um, you can see that the bacteria treated mice are kind of extended. The curve extends to the right and basically saying that it took longer for the mice to progress through the disease um, once if they were bacterial treated. And lastly, we can see our endpoint criteria, the um, you know, survival curve, and we can see that the butyrate producing, the blue line, the butyrate producing microbes have a more um, robust survival curve than say the vehicle. The acromantia has a, a moderate increase, but we love to see the extension of survival. And um, for the butyrate producing group, our p-value was 0 0.054 with an N of six. And um, so that's a good sign. We basically are, I'm basically saying that our bacteria treatment helped extend survival and helped preserve motor function in the sod one mice. Next, please. Oh, I'm sorry, back, please. <laughs> so if we um, look here in panel B, we can see a heat map of the global pathways um, of the spinal cord and spinal cord transcription profiles. We did a nanostream pathology panel um, at disease onset on day 120. Um, this is the spinal cord, not just microglia, this is spinal cord tissue. And we can kind of see that there is an, a change in the transcriptional profiles in some of these global pathways between um, treatment groups. Panel C and D showed that genes um, modulated by acromantia and butyrate producing bacteria. We can see if you look closely, some fuse, fuses there, which we talked about earlier, and a lot of different um, other genes. Panel E, we get a little bit more specific and we see that um, bacteria treatment reduces, can reduce and in some case reverses the gen genotypic effect that we see between the sod and the control mice. So if, for example, if you look at the first one in panel E, we see fuse from the vehicle wild type and the vehicle sod one mice, we see a complete difference in fuse expression. If um, once we treated the mice, we see those um, that expression reduced closer to the wild type um, expression. So again, we see that the bacteria treatment reduced and in some cases reverse the genes that are altered, um, the gene expressions that are altered in SOD1 mice. Um, Fuse is an ALS risk factor and also associated with um, RNA splicing. Um, some other genes that we see show this trend are the OxR1, if we could go back please, the OxR1 oxidative stress and the SMN1 back please, thank you. Um, the SM, SMN1 survival motor neuron one, which is also involved in, involved in RNA splicing. We also see a change um, in the unfolded protein responses where the bacteria treatment overcomes the genotypic effect that we see between SOD1 mice and the non-transgenic controls. Okay, next please. So basically in summary, um, we see that the sober microbiota can impact microglia pathways known to be important for ALS. The bacteria enriched in SOD1 mice are deficient and may drive these changes. And we identified acromantia as a potential candidate. Um, acromantia and the butyrate producing microbes slow down disease progression in the SOD1 mice. 
and the protection is linked to altered spinal cord transcription responses involved in um, splicing protein degradation and um, clearing that, clearing those um, aggregates. Ultimately, the microbiome might be an environmental risk factor that drives disease and modulation, um, the modulating the microbiota in ALS, and it may have a therapeutic uh, effect, therapeutic potential. Next, please. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank you so much, Black and Nero, for this amazing showcase. I've loved watching all these talks today. Um, thank you so much for Dr. Howard Weiner, who is my PI, and Lori Cox, who is my direct instructor, our collaborators at Mass General, and um, everyone who contributed to the project. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Iavo. Unfortunately, we are over time and we have to go ahead and go on to our keynote, so we don't have time for questions for Iabo. But if you do have them, um, you can look for our conference booklet, which should be posted on our website shortly. There you can find your contact information where you can reach out to her if you have any questions. Again, I want to thank all of our speakers today. You were just incredible. And this was such a wonderful showcase of all of the talent in Black and Neuro. And I really look forward to the rest of our sessions. I want to thank all of our judges for taking the time to be here today and, and judging these amazing presentations. I know it'll be challenging. Um, and then finally, I want to thank our conference sponsors again, without which this would not be possible. So with that, I want to thank you all for coming. And I hope you'll tune in for our upcoming keynote from Dr. Gina Poe.